I'm Tom Baker, this is Chasing Cars. Today, a comparison test of two premium SUVs, not from the usual suspects, Mercedes, BMW, Audi. Instead, I've actually got two of our long-term test cars from here at Chasing Cars. Over my left shoulder is my long-termer, Mazda CX-60 Azami SP with a 3.3 liter six-cylinder diesel engine. And over my right shoulder is Debbie Editor Kurt Dupre's long-termer, a Lexus RX 350 hybrid luxury with enhancement package. Two different powertrains, I'll give you that. But in today's comparison, I'm gonna be testing the CX-60 versus the Lexus RX. Which luxury SUV is better? And can the Lexus really be worth $16,000 more drive away as these two particular test cars sit? All of that and more in today's comparison. Before we get started, hit subscribe. Chasing cars, honest reviews of your next car. Brought to you by Budget Direct. On the price front, the Mazda scores early points because it is simply cheaper to buy than the Lexus. These two cars are direct rivals. Mazda is pitching the CX-60 as a luxury SUV. That's where the Lexus RX also sits. But of course, the RX has a lot more name recognition here in Australia and has become more expensive over time. Now, the CX-60 actually starts at just over $60,000 on the road here in Australia for a base model with the petrol six-cylinder engine. It'll cost you about 90 grand on the road to get into a base model RX. Now, our RX 350H Luxury is a base model, but we added the enhancement package to our long-termer, which is a worthwhile spec, bringing this khaki metal green RX 350 out to around $100,000 on the road. By contrast, our CX-60 is an Azami SP with the diesel six-cylinder engine, a pretty high-spec CX-60, but we, even with this free deep crystal blue color, it only ends up at about 84 grand on road. But of course, the comparison doesn't stop there. Jumping into the RX in this comparison reveals what is ultimately the more modern interior. There are fewer hard buttons in here, there's more stuff in the touchscreen, and you'll either like that or you won't. I think from the feedback, in our comments on our channel that I see on the internet, most people still seem to prefer a few more hard buttons, but at least the Lexus gives you a volume dial and you do have your temperature dials, even if fan speed, heated and cooled seats all have to be done through this screen. Thankfully, the screen itself is actually very bright, very snappy, very responsive, and the touch targets are big and you get some audible feedback when you actually get it right. Plus, there's wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto and the climate stuff is always on screen, always just at your fingertips. There is a smaller screen in front of you too, which has a small degree of customization, so not really a winner out of the Mazda and the Lexus in that regard, but there is a winner, I think, when it comes to overall seat comfort. I do like the seats in the Mazda, but the ones in this Lexus are seriously some of the best in the world. They're not that much to look at, but ergonomically, they are brilliant, and everyone that's driven this car at chasing cars for the last six months over a long distance has said so. Like the Mazda, this is a black and tan interior, all of the facings of the seat though in the Lexus are tan. They look good. As I say, they've got heating and cooling. Your steering wheel is just one color black as opposed to being two-tone. You do have little things like this driver attention monitor on the wheel in the Lexus that you don't get in the Mazda so prominently there. Quality, like the CX-60, is very good. Both of these cars feel well screwed together and premium inside. It's really quite hard to pick a winner in that area between the two cars. You'd really have to test them both yourself to see which one you prefer. What do you think? You can let me know in the comments. Out of these two cars, the CX-60 actually feels a bit more old school in the cabin, but in ways that I like, because fewer of the key functions are buried in the touch screen here in the Mazda. Instead, the CX-60 still has real physical controls for more stuff. That includes fan speed, temperature, seat heating and cooling, all of which is on this nice panel down here, Plus, you've got volume and a rotary controller for the central screen in the center. You still can use it as a touchscreen and do lots of things through that screen if you want to, but this is all safer and easier to use on the move than the Lexus, even given the fact that the RX has one of the better touchscreen systems out there. You also get this nice round steering wheel with two-tone leather in this particular car. That presents well. Like the RX, our long-term test CX-60 also has a tan interior, but there's a few more black highlights, including this center strip on the seats. The seats themselves, like the Lexus, are comfortable and ergonomic. They're noticeably firm here in the Mazda. I actually like that European style seat in a car. And the amount of adjustment is decent, but you only have in and out back lumbar in this car compared to four-way in the Lexus. So if you want to split hairs, you certainly can. 
However, I have been very happy with the Bose stereo here in the Mazda, which is loud, crisp, and clear. And the materials all feel really premium and luxurious. While the Mazda does have its problems, the interior isn't one of them. If you chop between the scenes of me sitting here in the back of the RX and in the CX-60, you'll notice one big difference, space. The amount of legroom in the Lexus is vast compared to the Mazda. There's a big reason for that. The RX is actually built on a front-wheel drive platform and our long-term is front-wheel drive. It doesn't even have all-wheel drive and that really gets you thinking, do you need all-wheel drive? Maybe, maybe not. Ultimately, in an ideal world, the CX-60 would probably be a little bit more fun to drive, having that rear-wheel drive bias and a bigger engine. But in reality, the jib isn't cut that cleanly because the Lexus is also very good on the road and people in the back seat have heaps of space. Headroom is a little bit less generous in the RX. I think the seat base is maybe a little bit higher, which is good for being able to see out the front. Your legs are very well supported in both cars, a touch better in the RX. You are getting your rear air vents, a temperature zone, and USB-C ports here in the back, but we don't have heated rear seats and we don't have a household power outlet. So I think in terms of amenities, the Mazda's a little bit ahead. In terms of space, the RX comes out on top. The RX does, however, have a very substantial armrest, deployable cup holders, some storage in there too. So on the whole, both are comfortable cars. This one just feels bigger. Here in the back of the Mazda, one thing you do notice is the fact that this car rides on a rear wheel drive platform, which is one of the big draw cards of the CX-60. But what it means is that the bonnet is very long and the cabin space is a bit smaller. Even though this is a fairly big car in terms of footprint, for me as a backseat passenger behind my own driving position, which is fairly close to the steering wheel compared to some other people, legroom is middle of the road. Tow room's good though. And headroom for me at six foot is acceptable even with the panoramic sunroof of this car. The CX-60 is wide, so you could probably get someone in the center, but it is a perch. There's a small hump in the floor, so I prefer to deploy the flip down armrest. You are getting, however, two air vents back here, heated rear seats, USB-C ports, and even a household PowerPoint, which is really convenient. Much like the back seats, there are some clear differences in the boots of these two SUVs, even though they are similar in size. Starting with the Mazda, the power tailgate gets out of the way quickly. It takes its own cargo blind with it. Nice feature, but it reveals 477 litres of space, which is really on the small side for this class. At least it's nice and wide, and beneath the boot floor, you get a space saver spare, which is becoming rarer and rarer in Australia. Not a good development. Heading across to the green Lexus, I quite like the rear end styling of this car, but I think both are reasonably handsome. One beep for the power tailgate on this car, then it shuts up. It reveals a bigger boot, 612 litres, but that cargo blind is just conventional. It doesn't attach to the boot. Under the boot floor, just a hybrid battery. So there's a bit more storage, but there's no spare wheel in this car. However, you can fold down the back seats at the touch of a button in this vehicle, which is better than the manual in the Mazda, but you wouldn't really complain about either, would you? So when it comes to practicality, the Lexus gets it in terms of cargo space, the Mazda's probably the winner if you need a spare. When it comes to running costs, it's the Lexus which is going to become cheaper over time. And that's because it is so fuel efficient. So is the Mazda. For a big diesel, the 6.8 liters per 100 kilometers that I've settled on over the last six months of mixed driving is impressive. But Kurt has managed 6.2 liters per 100 Ks out of the Lexus over the last six months. Petrol has trended a little bit cheaper than diesel here in Australia. So in terms of cost of fuel, this is gonna be about 400 bucks cheaper per year. When it comes to servicing, the Mazda can only go 10,000 kilometers between maintenance. The Lexus can do 15,000 Ks. So across five years of servicing, while the Lexus is slightly more in terms of its dollar figure over time, if you do bigger mileage, the Lexus ends up considerably cheaper on a per kilometer basis. Warranty, five years for both vehicles. The hybrid system on the Lexus is warranted out to a maximum of 10 years if you get a hybrid health check every year after the fifth year for free. Now, when it comes to driving the Lexus RX, if you're used to sort of big traditional six cylinder cars, you are gonna have to kind of work around any no replacement for displacement mentality because the way Lexus is doing things now and the way the RX is doing things is smaller four cylinder engines assisted with hybridization. So we're just in the base model here, the RX 350h, which is a 2.5 liter non-turbo petrol four cylinder 
with two electric motors if you have front wheel drive and three electric motors if you have all wheel drive like we do on our test car. That's good enough to make 184 kilowatts of power, so almost the same amount of power as the CX-60 diesel. Lexus does not quote a combined torque figure, but from the seat of our pants, it's about 400 Newton meters or thereabouts. And that is surprisingly effective to propel the RX quite smartly in a straight line. Of course, we performance tested these cars and the RX 350 was just under 7.2 seconds from zero to 100, which I think is quick enough for a big bus like this. If you want more, you can get a turbo four cylinder hybrid or even a non-hybrid version if you're dead against partial electrification. But as far as base models go, I think this isn't bad as a powertrain. Around town, it's very quiet as it leans on its electric motor much of the time. On the highway and on country roads, you definitely can tell it's a petrol four-cylinder as the engine kind of works away. And if you plant your boot, I mean, it's there, we can hear it, but this is a Lexus and there's a whole bunch of insulation against noise and vibration and it never becomes uncouth in the cabin. That's one way you'll tell the difference between a Lexus RX and a Toyota Kluger slash Highlander. The cars are similar, but they're certainly not the same. Now, when it comes to handling, that's where there's been a revelation at Lexus and Toyota in the last few years, because suddenly these cars actually handle quite well. The last RX was decent by the end of its life, but the new one is much better to drive than any RX before it with composed flat handling and superb ride quality, particularly on our test cars, sensibly small 19 inch alloy wheels. Now, some people will look at these wheels and think, gee, that's a small wheel, that's a big chunky tire, to which we say, that's the point. Of course, these wheels don't look as stylish as some out there, but having all that extra tire gives you plenty of insulation against common bumps, potholes, and just crappy roads here in Australia, and our RX rides brilliantly. But it also has good body control. If you are driving sportily on a country road and you hit a few bumps, the RX is unfazed. That's a massive difference to the Mazda, which rides badly at the best of times, but gets very upset by mid-corner bumps, which is a shock for a Mazda. Definitely a shock. Refinement, a little better in the Lexus, but there's not a huge amount in it. And the safety features are generally well-tuned and subtle, including the lane keeping. Compared to the RX, the Mazda CX-60 is a very different beast to drive in almost every facet. The main problem is ride quality, the second problem is transmission calibration, and the third problem is body control, but I'm gonna come back to those things because I wanna start on a positive, which is the powertrain for the CX-60. Now, you can get a couple of good powertrains and one that's not so great. There's two mild hybrid 3.3 liter turbo six cylinder engines, one petrol and one diesel, and you can get them on every trim of the CX-60. Then there's a four cylinder plug-in hybrid. The main advantage of the plug-in hybrid is that you can actually get it for less than the luxury car tax. So if you're a novated leasing customer, that car is gonna save you a bunch on your tax bill compared to other vehicles that you might lease that are not plug-in hybrid or fully electric but the plug-in hybrid is not fantastic to drive. It amplifies the negative aspects of the petrol and diesel. Now, the one that I ordered is the D50E. What does that stand for? Diesel 50, not really sure what that's about. And then E is the mild hybrid 48 volt system in this car. 187 kilowatts of power from this unit and 550 Newton meters of torque. And that's the way it feels to drive. Six cylinder diesels are usually tremendous powertrains in big heavy vehicles like this, and so it goes for the CX-60. It doesn't have brute force power, but it does have a flood of torque, which just lets you propel yourself along in a pretty relaxed way. It's not quiet. <laughs> it's surprisingly revvy for a diesel, and it actually pumps in some artificial noise, but you definitely know you've got a diesel engine working behind the scenes. Six cylinder diesels from Audi or BMW are typically quieter and more reserved acoustically. Not the case in the Mazda, but the engine works well. It's a little bit quicker than an RX 350 hybrid. We got a, I think around 6.8 second result out of our CX-60 long-termer, this car, which is not bad at all for a diesel SUV. The petrol is probably a little bit quicker again. 
And as I mentioned, the fuel efficiency is very acceptable indeed. So is the steering. The steering is definitely heavier and requires more effort than a lot of SUVs this size. But if you know your cars, your sports cars, and you know what steering is meant to feel like in those vehicles, you'll find the CX-60 steering very familiar. It's accurate. You actually do get road feel through the steering wheel in this car. As far as SUVs go, it is surprisingly good to steer and grip from the front end is also high. Take this car on a very smooth winding back road and you will see the goodness in the chassis and how fun it can be to drive. Unfortunately, at least here in Australia, there's not too many back roads that are completely smooth. And this car is absolutely flummoxed by bumps. The front suspension is overdamped. It is too stiff to the point where people think, geez, what was that clang through to the cabin from the front suspension? Meanwhile, it's on a completely different page to the rear suspension which is sloppy and underdamped, so underdamped, it allows so much float in the rear end that driving to a shoot on a country road earlier this week, our camera gear was flying around in the boot, unable to remain on the ground because the rear suspension is just bouncing away, doing whatever it wants. And it's not just our test car, it is all CX-60s we have tested. It is amazing that Mazda allowed this calibration to leave the proving ground when recent efforts like the current Mazda 6, CX-5 and CX-9 have all been so brilliant and improved through their life when it comes to ride and handling. The CX-60 is way off the mark of what this brand can do and way off the mark of what we expect in the mainstream SUV segment, let alone something premium like this. This is nowhere near good enough. And in this context against the Lexus, it becomes an easy walk for the RX on that point alone. Unfortunately, the criticism doesn't stop there because the eight-speed automatic with multi-plate clutch transmission in this car also isn't finished. Once the engine's warmed up and the transmission's warmed up, it's okay, but particularly when it's cold, it can be quite jerky and it can initiate very rough downshifts without notice and you get a big bonk into the cabin, which is definitely not luxury. The refinement is reasonable apart from all that engine noise. A little bit more road noise into the back seat in this car is what we've noticed over our six months with it. And you also get a lot of noise from the rear suspension, which is always doing something and fidgeting and sort of lightly banging around back there. Again, just not luxury. The safety features are, they're okay. You know, the adaptive cruise control is smooth, but the lane keeping is the kind that sort of tugs on the wheel when you come close to the line, but it doesn't activate all the time so it kind of stays out of the way and isn't too frustrating at least the 360 degree camera is very clear indeed after we filmed this video mazda announced that early customers of the cx60 are eligible to visit a dealer for a free suspension upgrade and transmission recalibration we will be testing this upgrade in an upcoming video to see whether the changes make a meaningful difference but we have reason to believe that they're relatively minor at this stage hit subscribe to make sure you don't miss that video. As for this comparison, we can only judge the cars that are in front of us. And at this point in time, the CX-60 was in its original form. Well, really, this is an easy verdict to come to. The ride quality and the transmission calibration of the Mazda just aren't acceptable. Mazda has to go back to the proving ground with this car, work out what's wrong and fix it. I think there is the soul of a good car here in the CX-60, but the production version Gen 1 is not that car. By contrast, the RX is accomplished and comfortable and fuel efficient and just finished. It feels like a car that's ready for the world. So in this comparison, the win goes to the RX 350H. That's my opinion. Let me know yours down below in the comments. While you're there, hit subscribe and the notification bell. As always, thanks for watching Chasing Cars.